Well, I, I do want to say thank you for worshiping the Lord vigorously in song. It's just such a privilege to uh, sing with all of you, sing praises to our Lord on a, on a Lord's Day. And we've already begun to prepare for communion by the lyrics that we just sang about Christ shed blood and him bearing our guilt and taking it away and being able to say that it's well with our soul. In fact, even to the point that the last stanza, we got to sing in anticipation of Christ's return. This could not have been a a better lyric to prepare us even for the text that I want to look at um, in anticipation of communion, taking the Lord's Supper together. Uh, If you have your Bibles, just grab grab your Bible and open up to Revelation chapter 5. We're going to look at a passage about the future that looks back at the realities of the cross. Revelation chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And then I began to weep greatly, because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing, as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. There's so much we could say about this incredible vision that unfolds in front of us. I'm going to highlight a few realities that pertain to our meditation this morning about Christ's work on the cross. As we see the scene unfold, obviously it centers around this this scroll, and this scroll, it's called a book in verse 1. It's really a, a scroll. It's written on the front and the back, and and, and the question is, what is this scroll? In fact, the inability to find somebody worthy to be able to open up this scroll causes the Apostle John to break down in weeping. There is no one worthy to look. There is no one worthy to open it. And this is indeed the title deed to creation. It was uh, the title deed, the right to rule the world that had been given to man by God, and we fouled it up. Who's worthy to take the title deed to creation when man has sinned, every last one of us. And lo and behold, in the midst of his tears, an angel tells him, don't worry, stop weeping. Here comes a lion, and he's worthy of the name lion, and he has the essence of lion, and he sees the appearance of lamb. And Jesus Christ of Nazareth shows up in the form of a lamb, having already been slain, and he is exclusively the one with the right and the worthiness to open the scroll and to look at it. We're talking about a reality that has sometimes been confused. Some, some theologies thinking about Christ's right to rule and reign would almost do, in, do an injustice to his right to rule and reign as man and view it as some sort of a mere spiritual rule. Let's just be honest. Jesus Christ has always, from eternity past to eternity future, had the right to rule and reign all he created. This is something different. This is something that's unique. It's unique to man in the Psalm 8 sense. What is man that you subjugate creation to him or the son of man? It's the reality that 
The author to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 2 that Psalm, Psalm 8 is, is certainly fulfilled in Christ, but we do not yet see it fulfilled. And here is John seeing a vision of the future, and here comes Jesus Christ, who's the only one with the right to rule and reign and to subjugate a cursed earth and restore it back to what it ought to have been. What's profound about this scroll is that as we read the book of Revelation from chapters 6 all the way through 19, we realize that as the contents of this scroll are unfolded on the face of the planet, it involves intense judgments on man. What's going on? Here's the one with the title deed, and he has this scroll that's recorded uh, horrific judgments and what's the connection? If we skip down to verse 9, we notice that the connection is, is certainly obvious. In verse 9, there's a song that erupts in heaven, and this may as well be our song. If you're in Christ this morning, this is our song. Verse 9, they say, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals because you were slain and purchased, purchased for God with your blood Men from every tribe, every tongue, every people group, and every nationality. And you have made them to become a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. What's profound about this is this is the blood of the Lamb being praised and worshipped because the blood shed by Jesus Christ on his cross is so effective and so powerful that God cannot help but commit himself to bring about the purchase of Christ's blood and to save those whom he purchased. He can't help but actually bring judgment on earth to guarantee the salvation of those who still, in the time of this vision, have not yet been saved, though purchased. It's that powerful, it's that effective. The, the effect of the cross is not just some sort of bridge-building exercise between fallen man and holy God in some sort of effect of making salvation possible. Instead, it's a purchase. It actually acquired salvation. It's a purchase that has been made. There's a transaction, and Christ has purchased those souls, he owns those souls, and he's giving those souls back to his Father. That's the object of worship here, is that quality of atonement, that quality of a transaction. In other words, believer, as we take the Lord's Supper this morning, the cross didn't make atonement a possibility, but a reality. The souls weren't made savable, they are actually saved. The blood didn't purchase every soul in general, waiting to see which souls would undo the work of this lamb standing as those slain. That's impossible. Instead, it actually purchased for God souls from every people group as his own possession. And then in verse 10, they continue the song with this line, you've made them to become a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon earth. And as we just sang about the trumpet sounding and Christ returning, all those who are is will reign upon this earth. That's a fact. And that's all accomplished by the effective blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now this commandment that we observe on the Lord's Day to remember Christ's death and resurrection in the communion as we pass these elements, it's it's commanded to believers, and if you're not in Christ, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't know what it means to follow Christ, if you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, if you don't know whether this atonement even applies to you, then we would just ask you to, to not partake. Believer, as we partake communion together, this should be our meditation this morning. We are remembering shed blood that didn't just give us an option it actually purchased our soul. Your salvation is as secure 
as Christ's sufficiency. We can't even mess that up. I want to ask the men to come forward with the elements, and they're going to pass these elements. In a few minutes, I'll come back up and uh, close this in, in a time of prayer. So take the elements on your own.